Hello there everybody, Sam's Trains here, welcome back to the railway and welcome to another review. Up today it is yet another brand new Backman steam locomotive. Yes, I know, it's another Backman review. I've done a lot of them recently, and honestly, to date, I had planned to do something different, but Backman have released yet another steam locomotive. This is the third one in a row in just a small number of weeks, and so, of course, it's got to jump the queue, and I'm looking at that today. I guess the Backman buses really do all come at once right, but today's review is going to be of this, the all-new tooled Backman LNER Gresley V2 locomotive. Now this is very exciting because a lot of Backman's most recent steam releases have either been small tank engines or little puny little pre-grouping tender engines. This is neither of those, much later on in terms of the steam age, and obviously it's a very large, chunky, tender locomotive. Backman have produced a V2 before, you can see one behind me there. I don't think they've produced them for many years, and the old ones had split chassis mechanisms, very basic in their level of detail. They date back many years. This one is all new tooled, as far as I can tell. I've not heard that this shares anything at all, any components or anything with the old model, so this is completely new. And as with all of Backman's new releases, or in fact all of Backman's releases full stop, this is quite expensive. It has an RRP of £229.95, which sounds shocking, but don't forget that Backman do actually supply retailers properly, so you can actually buy these, they are readily available from retailers for a discounted price. I bought this one, for instance, from D-Rails Models for £186.95, with most retailers now, if you want to order one now, selling these for around £195. Now, six months ago, I would have said that that was extremely expensive. And I still think it is, you know, very high expectations for this and all that. But given Hornby's new prices, given the prices of all of their crazy new products, and given even Backman's last couple of exclusive releases, the 812, which costs more than this, £200, and certainly the Precedent, which is even smaller yet even more expensive at £220, suddenly this V2 seems much more reasonable, doesn't it? Given how massive it is, I suppose. So, obviously, I still have high expectations for this, but it is really nice and it's really reassuring that I've been able to buy this for considerably less than £200, and I think I'll enjoy it all the more given that that is the case. So, let's take a look at this thing together. I've not had it out of the box yet, but already I can see a feature, an update, if you will, that I'm really pleased to see, so I'll I'll reveal that to you later on. For now though, let's get this out and let's see what Backman have done with it. All right, brand new tooled V2 from Backman. So as you can see through the front of the box, I went for the LNER green because I thought that looked the nicest. But of course, if the era isn't to your taste, then Backman are producing some BR green ones as well, which look very nice. And of course, if the green isn't to your taste, they've also got BR Black ones on offer as well. So in terms of choice, they've got you covered by the looks of things. Let me show the end of the box then so you can see exactly the version I've gone for. It's 35-200, nice round number. LNER V2 class 4791. And this is in the LNER lined green original, yeah, as built I would imagine. And these support 21 pin DCC decoders if you want to chip them. Right, let me show you the back of the box. Just a very, very brief history on these today, so pause and read if you'd like to, but I've got a little bit more for you on that in just a second, so no worries. All right, not had this out of the box as always, so this will be the first time on camera. Let's take a look and see what Backman have done. Let's see. I mean, it sure does look good through the front of the box, but you can't uh, get a full sense of what it's like. There it is, though. The box, I have to say, the box does feel fairly heavy, uh, not ultra heavy or anything, but there's there's some weight to it, which is pretty good news. Core, this does, it looks like something else altogether, doesn't it? I mean, compare it to this. <laughs> I mean, even from this sort of distance, you can see that there are some differences, to put it politely, can't you? Well, maybe I'll do a comparison one day, that would be fun, but uh, not today. This is not the video where the ancient horrid model overshadows the lovely new one. 
Although there's still a lot to be said for older, cheaper locos, that's for sure. Right, let's have a look then at the owner's information. So first of all, the first major reveal is the motor type. I was half expecting this to have a cordless motor, but it doesn't. It has a five pole, so we'll see what that's like. Running in, etc. Here we can see some of the accessories. It looks as though the model does come with lamps. You've got buffer beam details, you've got guard irons by the looks of things, you've got cylinder drain cocks all to fit separately, and they're all numbered and there's a key, so even though you've got quite a bit of work to do yourself, they've made it quite easy for you by showing you exactly where things go. Uh, or even more, even more, you've got cab doors, I think it looks as though, oh no, they're fitted to the tender but not to the loco, fair enough. Uh, brake rigging and such for the loco and for the tender. It looks as though there's something going on with the rear trailing axle, which is pretty interesting. In fact, we've got a key here. So 13 is optional flanged wheels for third radius curves or greater. So I can't use those because I've got uh, tighter than third. You've got 14 coupling tool. Now that sounds interesting. We'll have to find out about that. And then we've got a blanking plate and such. Fitting flanged wheels then. Right, all of our l &E V2 steam locomotives come with a set of flangeless wheels fitted to the chassis under the cab. This enables the locomotive to negotiate second radius curves without derailing. Really, Backman, really? You've gone and done a Hornby, haven't you? <laughs> Interestingly, the old V2 did not do that. It had a moving rear pony, which is interesting. But this shows you how to do it. You can see also that there are bearings on the rear trailing axle. Well, that's a quality feature, isn't it? Crikey. So they should go around nicely. Lubrication shows you where to lubricate. Tell you what, quite a lot to this model. Right, here we go. Uncoupling, right. So first of all, it's very obvious that Backman have changed the coupling. This does not use the insecure coupling that I've complained about so much. Whether the new solution will be any better is yet to be seen, but they have used a different one. What does it say here? While uncoupling the loco and tender, use the coupling tool to slide into the clip and twist to release. Interesting. So it's not just a push together, pull apart affair. It looks as though you do need a tool to be able to do that. Not sure how I feel about that, but I guess we'll find out. And then this looks like removing the body, a couple of screws by the looks of things. There's the motor, too early to see what sort of motor that is. Hopefully it will be a quality one. Decoder fitting and such. Looks as though the decoder socket is in the loco yet again. Another strange choice really, but okay, I suppose. Firebox glow and flicker. <laughs> I mean, the 220 pound precedent did not have that feature. Here we've got a much cheaper loco from the same manufacturer that does. So, I mean, wow. The features included on this model seem to be above and beyond, don't they? Which I wasn't necessarily expecting. Obviously, it's right and proper that we should get them, but like I say, the precedent costs so much more. I didn't really mention the price of the precedent very much during that review, but it didn't have that many features for what it cost. And already this much larger, heavier Loco seems to have a lot more in terms of features. So yeah, for, for this model, I'm pretty happy. Let's take a look at the accessories bag then, in which there is quite a lot. So there is the flanged rear set of wheels, which does indeed have bearings on it. You've got brake rigging for Loco and tender. This big long piece, I'm guessing that must be the coupling and uncoupling tool. Wow, we've got painted cylinder drain cocks, the cab doors, coupling hooks. Have we got some screw link couplings? Yes, I think we have. Yep, the screw link couplings, moving ones included. You don't always get that. Painted lamps, the lamps are all painted white. Uh, the vacuum pipe is also painted red where it should be. Wow. So, I mean, it's a kit. It's, it's very much a kit, but it's a kit that ought to look pretty darn good with all of that fitted to it. Right. Let's have the reveal then. Let's see what this thing looks like. Oh, my word. So, I mean, this is quite crazy, right? Because I have not seen a modern Backman l &E r Green locomotive of any kind, which means that all of the modern l &E r Green locos I have are from Hornby and they have a Hornby finish. This contrasts starkly with those. The quality, I mean, it looks such a sort of rich green. I hope the camera does this justice. A really rich green, fantastic finish. It's got the traditional Backman glossy finish. I'll say traditional. It's consistent with Backman's other models from the last few years or so. Core, cool. it really does look good. Right, let's lift this thing up. 
All right, there you have it. There is a close look at this beautiful loco. So, I mean, yeah, it feels, it does feel pretty heavy, but not perhaps as heavy as I was expecting. And it does feel as though the running plate is actually not die cast. Most of Backman's Locos do have die cast running plates, but as you can see, this one is very sort of flimsy almost because it's made of plastic. So I'm a little bit surprised by that. But in terms of how the Loco looks, very, very impressive. Even though the plastic running plate and the plastic body and such are not what I would call quality features, the appearance of the Loco definitely screams quality, doesn't it? It looks super detailed, it looks well assembled, it doesn't feel terribly sturdy in the hands because of the flimsy running plate, but certainly nothing looks as though it's dropped off, which I suppose is something, isn't it? So yeah, we'll take a closer look at this in just a second and see more of the ins and outs of it. But first of all, as promised, here is a bit of history on this lovely class in real life. The l &E -R Class V2 was one of many popular designs from the legendary engineer Sir Nigel Gresley. 184 of these unusual looking prairie tender engines were produced between 1936 and 1944. And I say the prairie wheel configuration was unusual, it was actually the only successful class of 262 tender locos ever to be used in Britain. Despite being completely unlike any other tender locomotives in appearance, the V2 was actually based on Gresley's A1 or A3, which you will no doubt be very, very familiar with, Pacifics, of course, and these V2s actually shared Gresley's favoured three-cylinder arrangement. It shared them with the A1s and A3s, but of course the V2 driving wheels are, are much smaller, obviously, thus dramatically changing the profile of the Locos. So these Locos were used for express mixed traffic work, and the design actually proved to be extremely capable, However, the axle loading was very high though, meaning that the V2s were quite limited in terms of route availability, to the extent that they actually couldn't be used on all of the X Great Eastern or the GER mainlines, necessitating the introduction of the much lighter V4 design. The class remained in use until the end of the steam era, more or less, with withdrawals not taking place until 1962, and the final withdrawal was made in 1966, and now, sadly, only one example remains under preservation. So there it is, Backman's brand new V2 up close and personal for you. And this really is a great looking loco, isn't it? Up here with the lights and the close-ups and such, I think you could really appreciate what a great, great looking model this is. In terms of the build quality, it's great. I've had a real close inspection of this now. It looks really, really good to the naked eye. Hopefully the close-up lens will agree with me in saying that. I started this review by saying that given the size of this locomotive, Backman's price for this loco actually doesn't seem that unreasonable given the other offerings that they've released recently. However, the plastic construction of the bodywork on this loco has caused me to change my mind on that. I assumed that for that price, this loco would at least have a die cast running plate, and the fact that this one is plastic is a disappointment to me. Now, to be absolutely clear, there is nothing wrong with this running plate. I mean, if I hold up a steel rule to it, you can see that it is not warped, which is more than can be said for when Hornby have used uh, plastic running plates in the past. And the same is true of the front of the running plate there. So, I mean, in terms of the appearance, it's okay. It's just, I don't know, this to me seems unacceptable on a, you know, a nearly 200 pound locomotive. And of course, don't forget, there are exclusive versions of this model, which do cost 230 odd pounds from a retailer, consistent value from that retailer, I might add. But that plastic running plate is a bit of a deal breaker for me. And it does show through in the weight. The weight of the total model is 409 grams, which actually isn't that bad, but it is lighter than the old Backman V2, which is a little bit embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, this horrible old thing weighing more than the brand new 200 quid for the most part Backman version, not ideal. I think for what this cost, the running plate could have been made of metal. Another feature of this that I can see people being disappointed by is the rear pony, but I have to say, this to me is not a massive problem. If you look at the wheels, they are basically almost touching the track. Unless you're inspecting those up close like this with a close-up lens or if your face is an inch from them, it looks as though those are on the track. It's a very, very subtle effect and it's a million times better looking than Hornby's attempt at this on the Hush Hush. 
And even more than that, if you do want a more realistic experience, Bikeman have included the flanged version of this pony truck. This pony is also sprung. It's very slightly sprung, so it will move up and down as the loco undulates on uneven track. And most crucially of all, from the outside, the rear pony assembly looks far more realistic this way, unlike the old Backman V2, where obviously in order to make that entire assembly pivot and move, the clearance had to be quite large and it was therefore less than realistic. Let's talk about the next big feature of this loco, and that is the updated coupling. This is the first time I've ever seen a coupling like this on any Backman locomotive or any locomotive at all. So, on the good side, obviously this is a more secure connection by the looks of it than the old version. It's not so easy to accidentally uncouple it, and also those messy wires are completely gone. On the downside though, this doesn't seem like a very sturdy coupling. I mean, if I apply some tension between loco and tender, yeah, I mean, that doesn't scream robust, does it, unfortunately? And here is the issue with it, right? With Dapol's solution, you can just pull the loco and tender apart, which means doing that makes the most sense when you're carrying the loco and tender around. This is different because for this, you need a tool. And human nature tells us that rather than sort of rummaging around to try and find this tool every time you want to pick the loco up, you're probably going to just risk it and lift them up together. And given the fact that this doesn't exactly look sturdy, that could be a little bit of a problem. So it's still not ideal, but for the first time, I am going to try uncoupling the two. So according to the instructions, I insert the uh, slim end, I suppose, of this tool into the underside of the coupling, give it a twist, and then it doesn't really explain what to do after that, but presumably you pull the two apart. So. Wish me luck, let's have a go. <laughs> the tool does not fit into, into the gap. <laughs> oh God, right, try again. I think I've got it in. Okay. All right, yeah, it's, it's a really horrible solution. I would not recommend uncoupling this every time you move the loco. I almost bent the pins as well with this tool because it's then, you're, when it comes apart, you're twisting the tool and the tool twists up towards the pins. So it's, it's a better design than the old one, but it's still not a great design, unfortunately. Right, how do we recouple this? That is the big question. Do we just push? No, we can't just push. The pins don't match up. <sighs> yeah, and recoupling them together is not great because that little clip that you have to unlatch, that stops the pins from lining up with each other. So you have to kind of manhandle the pins into the slots and then push the two together. It's not a good design, I'm afraid. I'm not a fan of that at all. So I'm just going to have to hope that it's sturdy enough to withstand being carried around carefully uh, while still coupled. So mixed feelings from that point of view. Now though, let's talk about what this loco does well. And you'll be glad to hear that the list for this is much longer. So let's take a look at the decoration. First of all, I cannot fault the finish on the boiler. I mean, the whole model, the finish looks great, but the boiler is where it's most noticeable. Fantastic satin finish. As I always say, Backman have nailed this finish. It looks good, it looks realistic, it looks metallic, without looking glossy and toy-like, and obviously without looking plasticky as well. It's quite a delicate balance, and I think Backman have got it absolutely right. Because of the size of this loco, there is a lot of decoration involved. As you can see, a lot of banding on the boiler here, which is all done to a very high standard. It looks very, very good indeed. Zero hiccups in the decoration there. The side of the cab is another very impressive area. You've got the running number on the side there, as well as a builder's plate. No etched alternatives for the plates and such on this loco. It is quite rare to get etched uh, plates as small as that, but it has happened on occasion. Not in this case though. The cab windows are also very convincing. They've got the sort of brown colored frames, which I think are very, very fine looking. They look great. And all the lining is top notch around those. And of course the glazing looks pretty good as well. It's nice and flush. So very impressed with that area. 
The firebox detailing has also all been picked out. As you can see, it really does look fantastic. Cylinders are lined as well with the utmost precision as usual. The running plate is lined as well. Quite a complex shape to this running plate, but it looks to be done very well on the whole. The steps are lined and the undercarriage, well, the pony, I suppose, underneath the cab, that is all nicely lined as well. So the decoration is absolutely wonderful. Wherever you look, there is wonderful decoration. The loco wheels, those are nicely decorated as well. Typical Batman wheels, they look like the usual cast ones, but they are nicely painted. And that is the front pony wheel as well, which is also nicely painted. The front buffer beam is also, it's an interesting shape on the V2, isn't it? I've always thought that. Quite an elegant profile to that front buffer beam. Again, lots of decoration on there. You have got these buffers which are blackened, but they are made of metal and they are also sprung, as you can see. So that is a decent feature of this loco, which is good. Now there is a parting line across the top of the locomotive, but it does look like it's more or less intentional. And of course there are lots of rivets up there as well, which help to hide it. The Banjo Dome does have a visible parting line on it, which does look a little bit messy here and there, but overall it's not something that you're going to notice while you're viewing the model normally. In terms of detail, we've got the separately fitted metal reverser rod here. I believe that is made of metal. And the most impressive part is more or less, it does match the finish of the coupling and connecting rods, which brings a very consistent look to the model, which isn't always the case in double O gauge, but here it is. And I think that makes a big difference. It just makes the whole model look quite unified. The coupling and connecting rods themselves look absolutely fine, by the way. Nice color on them, I would say, but, Visible screws holding them together. Multiple visible screws holding them together. Really? Really, Bankman? Are we, are we just not pretending that this is a premium model anymore? I'm genuinely quite surprised to see that on a brand new 2022 Loco. I mean, crazy. Look, Bankman, if you want to update your prices, update your practices. That's all I have to say on the matter. The running plate is well detailed, as you can also see, plenty of rivets, nice finish on it, with quite a lot of detail, actually, and I would think that at least some of this is going to be just part of the moulding of the running plate, and the fact that this is plastic, I suppose, would have made that a little bit easier. And then in front here, you've got those lamp irons, which all look nice and straight, that's good to see, and of course, you do have lamps to put onto those if that's what you want to do. Here's the smoke box door, it's complete with the handrail and the smoke box dart. Both of those look very nice and fine. It's also got the, uh, the lamp bracket, I've just noticed as well. But we haven't got the wow feature of the smoke box door opening, at least I don't think we do. The, the hinges do just look moulded on there. And the same is true of the vents up on top of the cab. Those are just static. Again, I mean, this is an expensive loco, isn't it? We're talking up to 200 quid, sometimes more than 200 quid for some versions of this. The list of features which could have been a little bit better on this loco does seem to be growing a bit, doesn't it? In front of there, though, there are two safety valves, and those do appear to be made of metal, so that in itself is a good quality feature. And then you've got a very tiny, fine whistle here, which I think is plastic, but it's not too bad. It doesn't quite match the safety valves in terms of finish, but it's such a small piece, I can't see it catching the eye. And then along the boiler, you've got the separately fitted handrail, which looks pretty good because the holders, of course, are painted black, and the wire handrail itself is in the green, apart from on the smoke box. You get a sense of the complexity here, don't you? And then you've also got the pipework underneath that, which also looks very nice and fine. And nowhere is there any glue visible on these parts, which I think is quite impressive. Right, let me tease you with the cab then. So we've got the tender full plate, which is quite an impressive piece. It's sort of sprung, as you can see. So if I push it down towards the tender, it springs back up again. I don't quite know why you'd want that, because the springing means that it will always be at the top of its travel, surely. Uh, but if it does get pushed down towards the tender where it might foul it, I suppose it would spring back up again. <laughs> that's, that's as far as I can think. And then inside the cab, you truly do get what you pay for. I mean, this is an enclosed cab. I mean, I'm having to move the tender out of the way to get a shot like this. And yet the level of detail inside there is really quite wonderful. So you've got all of the pipework. The pipework does look like it might be just moulded on and it's not separately fitted as it sometimes is, but it is nicely painted. All of the gauges are represented inside there. You've got some really tiny taps and turning wheels, very nice and fine. There is some separately fitted detail inside there. It looks like a handle there or something that is separately fitted as are the chairs and such. 
But the firebox is the nicest feature here. As you can see, it looks as though the firebox door, uh, or doors, there's two of them, are hinged and they open and close. So that really is a new level of detail, really, isn't it? I'm really interested to see how the firebox glow interacts with those doors. I mean, you can direct the light with those in a way, but like a spotlight, can't you? So yeah, that ought to produce a really nice effect. I'm looking forward to seeing that. Let's take a look at the tender then. It is quite a lightweight tender. I've been able to determine that by uh, lifting it up on its own and such. But it has received the same very high quality paint job, which you'll be pleased to hear. Yeah, wonderful finish on the body of the tender. The underframe, complex as it is, is all nicely lined. And as you can see, there's loads of molded detail here in terms of the axle boxes and suspension springs. And between the frames, you can just make out a water scoop molded inside there, which is really cool. The lining, as was the case on the Loco, is consistently high quality, very, very precisely applied, as you can see. And the l &ER lettering, as was again the case with the numbering on the Loco, looks to be very high quality, cannot fault that. The coal load up in top, I think it is separately fitted, looks like it is, but this is not the usual die-cast coal load that we get from Backman. I believe this is just a plastic piece, which again seems to be another downgrade that we've seen here on the V2 from other Backman Locos, but it's not a huge deal. The tender doesn't have to be heavy. I guess the die-cast coal was never a necessary feature before. And the finish on this coal is okay, and the detail on it is fine, so no big deal. It's just another noticeable change, which presumably will have made these cheaper to make. Then towards the front, you've got the cab doors, which are pre-fitted, or tender doors, I guess, because they're not part of the cab. And then you've got the little controls here, which are painted into the red. Plenty of the usual details up on the top. There's quite a bit of uh, definition to the sort of water filler cap there, which looks great. And then around the back, you've got some very detailed looking steps, more separately fitted handrails, lamp brackets, a buffer beam with holes in it so that you can fit the extra detailing if you want to. And of course, sprung buffers. Yeah, same as on the front. And then of course, finally, the Loco is complete with NEM couplings on the front and the back, which are pre-fitted. I haven't put those in but they are easily removable, so if you don't want one on the front, then you haven't got to keep it. So there we go. Overall, in terms of detail, it's probably more or less a five. It's not the most detailed in the world. I mean, it's pretty low on the flashy features, such as the opening air intakes and opening smoke box. But then again, you have got amazing features such as the finish and the opening firebox doors inside the cab. So overall, I would say the level of detail is amazing. Still disappointed in the lack of die-cast running plate, but I think really that's the only major disappointment. So it's not doing too badly. Now then, let's get it down onto the track for its first test. And I'll also take a look at the mechanism and show you what makes this locomotive tick or chuff, I suppose. So there she is, the very, very beautiful looking V2 down onto the track. I have just filmed the first performance test. It's in the can and I'm not going to spoil it for you as much as I want to. I will let you see that when the time comes. But after that, I went on and did my mechanical analysis of the Loco and that's what I'm going to show you now. So it's basically the same story with most of Bankman's modern Locos, really. The mechanism is decent. It ticks most of the boxes. However, it is still a little bit behind most other manufacturers, I would say. And in terms of how user-friendly it is to sort of own and operate and DCC fit and maintain these locos, that is the biggest problem, I would say, with this. It's not very user-friendly at all. But first of all, the pickup situation is okay. We've got pickups on all of the driving wheels, as you can see, wiper pickups. And then four of the six tender wheels also have pickups on them. Similar design to what we've seen before to the axles, but because of that new coupling design, there is no messy wires in the way. The wires are not sort of fouling the axles or the pickups. So that is an improvement. It's definitely tidier. Here is the coupling from below, and I have to say, overall, I don't like this design. To be fair to Backman, it does look better, right? It isn't quite as subtle as perhaps other manufacturers' solutions, but it certainly looks better than the old one. Uh, it's tidier because there's no wires, and I can spoil the fact that it does actually work. It's functional. But the con is the user-friendliness. I mean, it's just as bad as it was before, if not slightly worse. Before, it was too easy to accidentally uncouple locomotives and cause damage, and now it's far too difficult to uncouple the locomotive from the tender, which also makes it easy to cause damage. 
As I showed you earlier on, it's not that easy to uncouple it and it's quite a flimsy design, which means really as far as I'm concerned, I think you're just as likely to damage this as you were before, except now it's much more of a faff. So in a sense, it's one step forwards and two steps back. Overall, it's not much of an improvement. The Pony is a very good design though. As you can see, it is sprung, it springs up and down, and you'll see during the performance test just what a good design that is. Now the base keeper plate was a funny one because all of the screws were loose. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tighten them up, you know, finger tight as you would normal uh, to put this back together because it's a machine and screws that are loose will work themselves out. And I have tightened them back up again and there is no ill effect from that. So that might be something to check for you. The base keeper plate is hardwired, which is annoying in one way, but the wires connect to the back of it, which means the bearings and the wheel set are still accessible. If you want to clean and service them after a period, uh, you just have to pivot the, uh, the base keeper up a little bit. As you can see, there are proper bearings on these driving wheels, as is the norm with Backman now, thank goodness. And the wheel set is driven with a single axle. In this case, it is the middle axle, which yeah, definitely makes the most sense. Now, body removal of the locomotive is very important here because as we saw in the instructions, the decoder socket, for strange reasons, is in the locomotive and not in the tender. So the ease with which you can remove the loco body is really, really important. And here's a spoiler, it isn't easy at all. Now this new loco to tender coupling has just four pins on it. Uh, I think only two of them might be being used unless they sort of double them up to improve continuity. But if the decoder socket was in the tender, they would have to have more pins than that going between the two uh, because you've got the firebox flicker, the loco pickups and the motor to sort of connect between the two. So I guess that's why they've done it. I don't think it was worth it because as we're gonna see in a second, the firebox lighting, at least on analog, isn't very good. But back onto body removal, like I say, not easy to do. You don't have to undo the coupling to remove the loco body, but I would highly recommend it because if you don't, then the tender is part of the equation and you've got to watch what you do with it and you could break that coupling if you're not careful. Then the front pony is in the way of the front body screw. There's no hole through it so that you can undo it easily. So the front pony has got to come off, that's one screw. Then there are three screws at the front, so that's four in total. Two screws at the back. The back screws are not proper screws in the sense that they don't like thread properly. You can tighten and untighten them all day long and they just don't go anywhere. So I had to help them out. And when I put them back in later on, by the way, they didn't screw in properly. So they must be just like dodgy self-tapping ones, I suppose. And then at long last, when all six screws are out, you are able to remove the body, but there are wires connecting the chassis to the body because the coupling to the tender is part of the body. I mean, Dapol, with all their faults, have wiped the floor with Backman here in terms of usability and how easy it is to DCC fit and access their models. This is slightly ridiculous, I have to say. Anyway, here is the chassis. It's quite a busy chassis, of course, because all of the DCC, everything is inside the loco. There is the five pole motor, no flywheel, unfortunately. That's not ideal, is it? This is a large loco, plenty of space, no flywheel though. There is the DCC socket, that's the 21 pin, and you've got the pre-fitted speaker underneath that. The LEDs are underneath this little bonnet, which again is not ideal because the light has to reflect off this bonnet down into the firebox area, and then it reflects off the firebox, out of the firebox into the cab, where there are also sort of firebox doors, which also impede the light. So you will notice, at least like I say on analog, when I run this, the firebox glow is almost, not entirely, but almost unnoticeable which makes me question really, was it worth it? I don't think it was. Maybe it works much better. Maybe it's much brighter on DCC. I'm not trying that today, unfortunately, but maybe that's a maybe. And then the gauge is okay as well. 14.2 millimeters back to back, just below 14.2. That's about right. That's about what the other locos I've looked at recently were at. Right, so let's jump back in time. Let me show you what happened during the performance test. Okay, the first ever performance test then. Obviously, expectations are very, very high. Let's see if this loco does enough to meet them. Right, first question, as always, does the loco work? Yes, it's moving off. Now, the instruction said that everything is factory lubricated, so it shouldn't need any oil from the factory. And as this has literally just come out, uh, that should still be true. It hasn't been sitting on a shelf for years on end. 
uh, so we should be okay from that point of view and yeah the loco is actually working there we go and it so far at that speed at least seems nice and smooth Let's have a look at the gearing and the speed then. Now this Loco has a, a traditional five pole motor, not a cordless motor, so I don't expect the speed to be a problem, but here it is at 50. Yeah, that seems sensible enough, doesn't it? And just to show you what the top speed looks like, I'll do this briefly because it's not been run in yet. Yeah, I mean that, compare that with the precedent and the 812, that is remarkably sensible, isn't it? Very, very sensible. I did just notice quite a, sudden stop so has this got a flywheel again this is a premium model at a premium price uh, so it should i don't know i mean you guys know i don't i'm about to find out after this <laughs> but i don't think it does and i didn't see one on the diagram so i'm guessing not right how's the crawl then let's see what this is like at the slow end obviously don't forget a crawl indicates a high quality mechanism i am easing it up Okay, I saw a twitch. Is it moving? No, it's not moving. Right, let's keep going a bit more then. Increase. There we go. I've now let go of the controller. So don't forget, this has not been run in. It will need 30 minutes in each direction before it's at its best. So even though this is pretty darn good, it's not necessarily at its best. But <laughs> I mean, wow. It does seem to be remarkably slow, does that, doesn't it? Uh, it does keep sort of starting and stopping a bit, so I'm going to turn it up a bit. I mean, I would say that that indicates to me a quality motor, because the control there is quite insane. There we go. Ooh. Right, so I turned it up a touch, and then it, it sort of took off. So let's try that again. I mean, overall, I mean, let's go a little higher, even. That is fine it's pretty good there does seem to be maybe a little bit inconsistent but it does it is better than some isn't it that's for sure yeah i mean that is a really nice smooth motion isn't it let's go for that speed that speed is beautifully smooth i wonder what the torque's like I think it should be okay because there's obviously some decent gearing in there. Let's have a look. Okay, <laughs> I'll take it back then. So not a huge amount of torque there, um, but I suppose at 50% speed it should be turning its wheels. Let's just verify that. Again, I want to be quite careful with this before it's been run in. There it is at 50%. Mm. Seems to be there's some sort of tight spot there, but again, this is this, these are things that might improve as it runs in. But yeah, that is okay, isn't it? That is okay. Right, so more slow speed testing in a while after it's run in. But for now though, let's send it off around the layout and fingers crossed please that it makes it around the curves and doesn't derail on my lovely, lovely track work. Okay, here we go. All right, here we go around the curves, very little slowdown, no derailing, good pace, wow, very impressive. Now, in terms of the engineering side of this, this is more than very impressive if you ask me, because those rear wheels, they spin, right, so they're touching the track. The fact that they are touching the track so that they spin and yet don't drop below the track on second radius curves and cause derailments He's quite wonderful to me. That That is some real precision engineering right there, and I have to take my hat off to Backman for that. And finally, we have an example of a loco with rear trailing wheels like this that has been done properly, which shows Hornby that there is absolutely no excuse for the shoddy workmanship that we've seen from them on the likes of the Hush Hush and quite a few others. So thank you, Backman, for doing a proper job on this one. I'm impressed, I'm very impressed. Uh, second radius, it's working okay. My layout isn't perfectly flat, the track isn't particularly well laid, and yet the Loco doesn't seem phased by it at 50% speed. So very, very impressive. Uh, yeah, performance is better than expected so far, very much so. Okay, so 30 minutes in each direction. I will come back and see you when that's done, and we'll have some more fun with this thing. All right, see you in a sec. All right, folks, we are back. There we go. So overall, yeah, running in, no major problems. 
It has, just like the precedent, developed a really annoying squeak, which is less than ideal. Let me play some of that for you. You hear that? <laughs> Yes, not ideal. I do suspect it's the tender. Or at least some of the non-driving wheels, because you can still hear it happening. But this does suggest inadequate lubrication. So perhaps a little bit more wouldn't go amiss, because this is the second time in a row now that this has happened. Overall though, performance seems good. It's nice and consistent. At the slower speeds, it does seem to slow down on the tighter curves, unfortunately, which does support my theory about this not having the greatest torque. And in fact, again, if I, now that it's running, if I show you it running with me putting some pressure on it, you can see that there is definitely a tight spot in the rotation, which probably isn't gonna help things. So that's not ideal. But let's see what the crawl is like now, shall we? It is on the express points here, which I guess is a bit mean. So let's move it off. Okay, let's see if we can get it to sustain a crawl. Here we go. Bit more maybe. So, hmm, it's all right. It is cogging a little bit more now, I would say, which is weird because the precedent was a bit worse after it ran in as well. Uh, yeah. It's cogging a little bit more, isn't it now? Sort of moving in sudden increments. So the crawl itself isn't great. Uh, whether that's because of the lack of flywheel, I'm not sure. Let's try it forwards. Mm, seems a bit better forwards. But the fact of the matter is we have seen locos that are more controllable at the slow speed. That said, and this is a big that said, at the higher speeds, it really is nice and smooth. Like at this speed or anything higher, Oh, that whistling is annoying. Really annoying. <laughs> At these speeds, it's very, very good. I mean, that is just positively gorgeous, isn't it? Really, really nice. Is that... Let me lift the tender off. Is it the front pony? <laughs> I think so. It's still, it's still making the... Not right. Is it... No, it's not unfair to oil the front pony, just for my own sanity. I'll be right back. Okay, let's see if that's any better. I normally don't oil locos and such during reviews. I like to review them exactly as they come from the factory, but I haven't oiled any of the driving wheels. It's just the non-driven wheels. So that won't make a difference to the performance. It just might stop me from going absolutely insane from having to listen to the squeaks. Right, I think, there we go. Silence at last. Okay, let's do that again just to make sure so yeah, I mean, it's okay, isn't it? The performance is all right. We've seen better, but I think it's it's more or less adequate. You have to take the context of these locos into account. In real life, they weren't shunting around at ridiculously low speeds. So it's not a massive problem that this can't crawl very well, but it would have been nice to see it do a bit better. Pulling power though is okay. I measured 0.43 newtons, which equates to around 26 coaches on straight and level track. That is more than a Hornby A4. I've always said the A4s have reasonable pulling power, so I think this certainly does. So let's go and couple up to these seven coaches. Yeah, it's a good old rake. Let's see how the V2 handles them, hopefully quite nicely. Although mm, maybe that torque issue will become more of a problem with the load. We'll see. All right. <laughs> Let's make sure the coaches are on the track. All right, yeah, they're looking good. So finally, it is united with coaches of its own kind. So here we go. Let's see if it can do it. No, oh, not bad. Yeah, a bit of a stutter there, which spoiled the takeoff a bit. But overall, nice convincing performance. Up to around just less than 50%. Now I think that looks good. Okay, so for comparison, let's also run the old V2 from Backman. I wonder if this was a better crawler. I honestly can't remember. I shouldn't think so, but you never know. Yeah, it is actually. <laughs> so the old one has been, I mean, it's had the socks knocked off it in terms of detail, but it's still the winner in terms of weight and indeed performance. So given its horrible split chassis mechanism, that doesn't say much for Backman's modern production techniques, does it? Hmm, bit disappointing that. And then on the inside line, I've just got another attractive LNER green locomotive, 
although if you want to be pedantic, and I know a lot of you do, uh, it is technically a BR livery. So this is the lovely peppercorn design, this is the A1 I believe, and that's also a Bankman Loco, and it did have the die cast running plate and it's much heavier as a result. All right, let's go watch the performance. Here we go then, Gordon's Hill with a hefty train of coaches. Yeah, the slowdown on that curve wasn't too noticeable at 40 or 50 speed, whatever I've got it at, I forget. And as you can see, it's handling those coaches no problem at all, up the slight incline, so that's very good. So, overall I'm going to say I think the performance is good. Not the best, of course, but overall I think it's good. At the higher speeds it's fairly smooth, the crawl isn't terrible. I think the crawl is the weakest aspect of it, but overall it is smooth when it's running normally. It's a good puller, it doesn't derail or anything. The rear pony setup is very impressive, that works very, very nicely. Yeah, overall it looks incredible as it runs along. Uh, the performance isn't doing anything to take away from the realism, at least not right now, just having it run along like this. So overall, yeah, I think the performance is very, very good. Here is the, uh, <laughs> the firebox effects. On analog, mind you, so maybe it will look better on DCC, I'm not sure. But then again, Dapol managed to get theirs to flicker and do everything on analog. Uh, but yeah, this is at full power. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you're not going to see it, are you? You're really not going to see it, unless you park your face right above the cab. You ain't going to see it. But mileage may vary. Uh, if you've got one of these on DCC, let me know. Is it so much better that it becomes worthwhile? I'd be interested to know. Let's have some ratings then for the brand new Backman V2 locomotive. And overall, as you can see, yes, it's great. It's a good looking loco, the performance is good enough, and the value for money is definitely better than the exclusives I've just looked at. So the level of detail I've given five star. I do recognize that this is maybe a little bit generous as it doesn't have the opening smoke box door and the air vents that move on top of the cab, but to be fair, if you look at all of the other great details this Loco has, when you consider the decoration, when you consider the cab, all that sort of thing, I would say overall the level of detail on this Loco is superb and I'm not going to knock it down because of those one or two small missing features. The performance though I've given four stars, overall it's a good performer, it's very smooth, however there are some torque issues at times, particularly on tighter curves, you can see it slowing down, and something does seem to be a little bit tight at times, but overall in normal performance it's absolutely fine. The pulling power is pretty good, I would say more than adequate, 0.43 newtons, that is the tractive effort, uh, which equates to around 26 coaches on straight and level track. That is more, very up by a little bit, than the A4 and the A3 from Hornby, so that's pretty good going, I would say. Had it had the die cast running plate, it would be even more, and the pulling power would be really something quite special. But overall, pulling power is okay. The mechanism then, I've given three star. In order to get five, this would have need a better coupling, it would have needed a flywheel, and it would need to be far more user-friendly to access for DCC fitting and maintenance purposes. Besides that though, there are good aspects of the mechanism here. Five pole motor, proper bearings on the wheel set, and a decent number of pickups. So mechanism, not too bad. Quality then, four star. Overall, this is a really, really high quality loco. The build quality is fantastic. The precision in the decoration cannot be faulted. The only thing that disappointed me here, and again, maybe I've been generous in only knocking off one star for this, is the plastic construction. I really was expecting a die cast running plate at the very least here, and I was disappointed to find that that was not the case. Apart from that though, a very high quality loco, which brings us on to value for money, the RRP £229.95. I think that's silly, I wouldn't recommend paying that. But for £186.95 that I paid, taking that into account and the typical retailer price at about £195 at the moment, yeah, I don't think it's too bad. I've given it three star, it would have been higher if there was a die cast running plate, I think that would have made a big difference, but I would say that the value for money is at least better than the exclusives I've looked at from Backman so far this year. Overall then, that is a pretty good score, we're into the 8s, 8.03 out of 10. Let's pop that into the logbook then, and there it is, yes, top place above the 812 and the precedent. Don't get me wrong, I think it's similar to the 812 and the precedent, but the fact of the matter is, it works better, better performer, it's cheaper, and you do get a lot more loco for your money. Yes, there's no die cast on this, or at least not on the bodywork, but overall, you do get more for your money with this loco, I think, which makes this a more sensible purchase, in my opinion. 
So there you go then folks, that is my review of Backman's brand new V2 locomotive. And overall, while it's not perfect and there are things that could have been a lot better I think, I would say that this is a good loco. It is a little bit overpriced for what it is and I think it should have been better for what it cost. But overall, there are definitely worse value for money locos out there, that's definitely true. And you can't deny that it looks absolutely incredible. The finish, the decoration, they are truly up to Backman's usual standards. In fact, I would say Backman's locos are looking better and better with every, every new one that comes out because, yeah, the finish and the decoration, they are just nailing these days and that is really, really good to see. So that is one aspect of this model that is worth paying for, you know. I think I might have been a little generous on the performance. I'm not sure whether it's worth four star. I think three might have been a little bit too harsh though. So I'll tell you what I will do. I'll post a poll over on my community tab and you can uh, give the performance a rating of your own and we'll see what you guys come up with. But for now, I hope you enjoyed watching this review as much as I enjoyed making it. It's a stunning, lovely looking loco. And overall, I am really, really pleased with it. So thank you for watching. If you want to buy one of these, yeah, I would recommend it if the price, as usual, doesn't put you off because you do get what you pay for in terms of what the model looks like, which is quite important, I suppose. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you soon with some more videos. The next review hopefully won't be a Backman one. <laughs> we'll, we'll have a bit of a change. Not that there's anything wrong with Backman Locos, mostly except when they don't have die-cast running plates and horrible couplings, which are a very, very frustrating nuisance, but I digress. All right, folks, see you on the next one. Cheers, everybody.